we know who came from Magdala, right? Uh, it yeah. was Mary. Mary. Yeah. Mary. Now, what happens typically is they confuse Mary with the woman who was, uh, came and washed the Lord's feet with her tears and w wiped his, uh, her tears off with her hair. That's not right. Mary. It's, it's, that's, don't confuse her because they want to put Mary in a situation where she, you know, she's a prostitute or something like that. That's, that's another woman. Mary came from Magdalene, and what the scriptures say about Mary is that she had seven demons inside of her, and the Lord exercised the demons out. Now, one of the things about the exorcism of demons is there were three messianic miracles that the rabbis said, when you see these three messianic miracles, then the Messiah is here with us. And again, it wasn't that they took some of it from, you know, the prophet Isaiah and a few other things, but really it was three things when the messiah comes he will be able to heal leprosy he will be able to heal blindness and he will be able to exercise deaf and mute demons okay and those were the three signs now mary didn't have a deaf and mute demon but she did have demons and let me explain to you why there was so much the demonic activity happening uh, during the gospels and if you read in Revelation chapter 12, it says that it talks about the antagonism between Israel and Satan, okay? And Satan, again, we talked about wants to destroy Israel. Well, John in Revelation rehearses the history of Israel with Satan and explains a few things. And it says basically that his tail, the dragon's tail, drew a third of the stars from heaven um, and that is in concert in the context of, Jan uh, of Revelation chapter 12 of when Satan saw that Jesus was on the ground, Messiah is on the ground, he took all of the third of the angels that fell with him and they all came here. And so there was massive demonic possession, massive de demon activity, massive fallen angel activity around the situation. And like she said, to go over there, we'll see Kersey where uh, the demoniac was. He had legions in him, okay? And he exercises that and anyway, casts them in, into pigs and they run off into the, the ocean, or sorry, the sea. But, but let's go back to Mary Magdalene. So he, he, he exercises... Uh, the demons out of her. At that point, she becomes a, a, a follower of Jesus all the way through. Um, and she's so appreciative of what he did for her that he's with her, uh, sorry, she's with him in his travels. She's at the cross. She watches the cross and she's one of the first ones at the tomb. Mary Magdalene was at the tomb. Okay. So this woman had such a, a, a fierce dedication to him and loyalty. We call it Hesed. A loyal love and she had that because of what he had done for her she was appreciative of her a lot of people were healed by Jesus but they didn't even follow him sometimes but she did and it's it there's there's some church history about it that she possibly could have been a wealthy woman that was one of the uh, patrons for the ministry of of the Lord because a lot of itinerant preachers had patrons and even Paul had a patron um, that was, she sold, uh, it was um, Lydia, she sold uh, purple dye and she made a lot of money. She actually was funding the Apostle Paul for his journeys and, and so you will find there's always patrons. So it, again, it's, it's coming from church history so I can't point to scripture, but it's possible that Mary Magdalene was one of the patrons that helped the ministry of the Lord. Okay, so here's an interesting thing that happens. She's one of the first that sees Jesus after the resurrection, okay? And the first thing she wants to do is grab onto him. She recognizes, she says, Rabboni. She hears the voice, Rabboni. And he says, stand back, don't touch me. Okay, this is different because in a week later, he will have uh, Thomas, touch, touch me, look it, feel me. You know, and, and she says, he just, don't cling on to me. I have not risen to my father yet. Okay. But yet we know he allowed the other apostles and the other women to touch him even after this. Well, what's the deal with this? Well, this is very interesting. So tonight, when you get a chance, I want you to read the ch Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. And it's talking about that the blood, that blood is the only thing that gives the remission of sins. And he, he, the writer of Hebrews say, look, the animals 
uh, of bulls and goats could only cover but not take away sin. And then he goes into talking about the Messiah's blood and how powerful that is to take away sin. But then he says this in verse 12, and then I think in somewhere in verse 23, 22, somewhere in that neighborhood, that Jesus enters into the heavenly tabernacle, the one Moses patterned the tabernacle off of, the one that's in heaven, and presented his blood and cleansed the heavenly tabernacle. And now that's, we will read that and that throws him for a loop. So what is that? He said, I had not risen to my father. So what we try to understand as best as possible is Jesus took his blood to heaven to cleanse the heavenly tabernacle. And that's why she couldn't touch him. He had done that. Now we're not talking, we're talk, the, the ascension was 40 days later, but he could go back and forth. And apparently he went back, took his blood and cleansed the heavenly tabernacle. So here's my question to you. Why did he have to cleanse the heavenly tabernacle? Because of what Satan did in his rebellion. So there's no humans, obviously, that had desecrated the, the, the tabernacle in heaven. Only Satan did that, and he did it with a third of the angels that fell with him. So even Messiah's blood not only atones for your sin, but it was able to be used to, to um, cleanse the heavenly tabernacle with his own blood. Okay, so that, and read, read Hebrews. If I'm lying, I'm dying, okay? People don't hear this, but it's the only thing that makes sense of Hebrews chapter 9 where it says he took his blood to heaven. Okay, so then th we assume that that's why he told Mary, don't touch me now. And that he had apparently did that because he would disappear. Well, where did he go? Okay, and then he reappears and then he could, they could touch him. So the, 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 the theological theory is he had taken his blood to heaven and then he allowed them to touch him because they wouldn't contaminate that with his blood. So um, one day, you know, when we're in heaven, you might actually see the blood that was shed for you in heaven. And it would be God to do preserve that, right? It would make sense. It would be put on the heavenly the, uh, altar and, and things of that nature. So it's pretty amazing. But I, I, I challenge you, just read that because it's the only thing that makes sense. Why You hear commentators say, well, you know, he, he, he's trying to tell her that, uh, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm not leaving you. You don't have to hang on to me. That's not what he's talking about at all. That's a Gentile interpretation. Uh, that doesn't make any sense. It only makes sense if you understand Mosaic law, if you understand tabernacle law. Even in the millennial kingdom, there has to be blood sacrifice in the kingdom because sacrifice is necessary. Not in the kingdom age, it's not for redemption. It, the blood is for purification, okay? You're not getting close to Jesus in the messianic age unless you have blood. And it's a purification. It's not for salvation. Salvation is by faith alone, okay? But still, if you read Ezekiel 30, uh, 40 through 48, there are blood sacrifices again in the Messianic age. And it's always because a sacred space, holy space. And in, when you have holy space, things must be purified. And it's only purified by what? Blood. You will never get away without having blood. It goes back to Cain and Abel. And it still continues in the Messianic age. All right, so that's a little bit about Mary Magdalene. So um, that'll be, we'll wrap that up. <laughs> so um, anyway, we have a lot of other things to see over here. So.